Good morning, everyone. We're going to uh, begin our study of John chapter 3, as we do all things in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. To get us into uh, our Bible study today, we'll take Psalm number 25. And as we see Psalm 25, we'll see a connection, obviously, with the gospel. Some of the clearest gospel in the Bible comes in John chapter 3. I think we'll get to verse 16 today, God so loved the world. And Psalm 25 is, is God's uh, clear love uh, that he rescues those who are in shame, uh, that he guides us in his paths, and that we walk in, in his spirit. So let me read uh, some of the... Uh, introductory words that the Psalter has about Psalm 25. If you have the Psalter, it's the italicized uh, words on page 121. It says, the church sings Psalm 25 in services that encourage a Christian life of repentance and faith. In Hebrew, this Psalm is an alphabet acrostic, offering petitions and praise from A to Z, with the last verse extending beyond the end of the alphabet. Uh, Martin Luther said, Psalm 25 is a prayer. The psalmist prays for piety and forgiveness from God and asks to be guarded and rescued from sin and shame, enemies and all evil. Uh, the psalm treats truly individual needs and circumstances. It includes confessions of sins, laments about enemies, and requests for wisdom and righteousness. So as we look at Psalm 25, uh, let's for our opening prayer say uh, verses 1 through 7, and if we read it responsively by the half verse, I'll read the first one and, and y'all can respond with the one or two lines that are indented. Okay. So, In you, Lord, my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame, but shame will come on those who are treacherous without cause. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you, Lord, are good. And so our prayer today. Lord, do not remember the sins of our youth and rebellious ways. Remember instead the great mercy and love that you have shown your people for hundreds of generations Forgive our sins and teach us to live lives of integrity through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So getting into John chapter three, yes, a uh, chapter on forgiveness, a uh, chapter on living a life uh, in the spirit. So that's going to continue the thoughts that we introduced with uh, Psalm 25. So in, we have Nicodemus who's going to be coming to Jesus, and we spoke a little bit about Nicodemus uh, uh, last, uh, last week, and I told you I was going to look up what his name meant, but I forgot. So if you really are interested, you'll have to send me an email or, or look it up off, uh, I'll, I'll, look it, I'll try to remember to look it up for next week, or somebody take a note to remind me. Um, but uh, let's get right into it as we have a really a, a teaching evening that Jesus is becoming the, the great teacher here. Um, and why don't we go ahead and do it? Uh, Sue, why don't you just take the first paragraph, uh, verses one and two. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these miraculous signs you are doing unless God is with him. So the introduction, we had a Nicodemus presented, a teacher, a member of the Jewish ruling council, um, recognized that uh, we don't hear how quickly it happened that Nicod these words from Jesus um, brought him to a deeper faith, but uh, there is... Uh, there is some faith here calling Jesus my teacher, 
Um, he's from God, uh, but he doesn't have a deep faith. He's, he's puzzled. He's trying to figure out more, and he he wants to know what was it that brought Nicodemus to uh, to the realization that he came from God? The miraculous signs. The miraculous signs eh, that uh, he he has power that human beings don't have. He must be from God. That was Nicodemus's conclusion, and he took it as a very obvious conclusion. Um, and he uses the we, what was he speaking on behalf of some other hidden council members, or was he just speaking, uh, speaking in general? Um, we, we don't really know that, but, uh, but it's, a, it's a general thing that, that is seen, at least with that we. Uh, Carol, would you, uh, any questions before I move on to, uh, yeah, okay. Carol, please, would you uh, take verses three and four? Yes, Jesus replied, Amen, amen, I tell you, unless someone is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? All right, so amen, amen, or amen, amen, and that means, hey, pay attention, this is important. Um, and so let's look at that sentence, right? unless someone is born from above and that greek word of that's from above is the greek word anothen and uh it not a bad translation to just say again but uh it literally it does mean um it, it's a different than just a re repetition word uh from above is, is a more literal translation and jesus is going to explain that phrase in a little bit and, uh, but being born from above, according to this verse, is a prerequisite for seeing God's kingdom. I would take a moment to, when you hear the word kingdom of God, uh, what comes to mind? How would you answer the question, what is the kingdom of God? Carol? Yeah. To me, it's all the blessings of God. It's the coming of the Holy Spirit. And to me, this this is Jesus introduction to moving Nicodemus's mind from earthly things to spiritual things. Okay. Yeah, moving moving Nicodemus's mind from earthly to spiritual. He really develops that and and kingdom of God might at first uh, and especially in that day and age have had connotations of an earthly kingdom, a mess messianic revival of David's kingdom on earth, the kingdom of God now in Jerusalem. Um, and, and, and that might have been the original thought. Jesus is going to prevent that uh, with his description later on uh, or correct that if that's the impression. Where else do we see uh, or do we regularly use the phrase kingdom of God or God's kingdom or thy kingdom? Prayer. So uh, any, any, any comment more about what, uh, what we think of when we say the Lord's prayer and thy kingdom come? Celia? Your kingdom here on earth and in heaven. Okay. God wants us to enlarge the kingdom here on earth. Okay, yep, the kingdom, the kingdom on earth. And so uh, if the kingdom is on earth and the kingdom is in heaven, what is the kingdom? Well, simply put, a kingdom is something that the king rules, right? Who's the king? God. Where does he rule? Heaven and earth. Heaven and, and so all things, the whole universe. So God's in the whole universe. So why do we say thy kingdom come? If God's kingdom is the whole universe, well, there's a narrow, narrower focus of the kingdom. So the kingdom of God ruling all things, that is God's kingdom of might. Okay, it's kingdom of power. We have another kingdom that we would ref that, that would be a part of that, and that would be the kingdom of grace. What is the kingdom of grace? not the entire universe believers. believers god's kingdom in our hearts right the kingdom of god is within you is that phrase right what what is the kingdom of god god's gracious rule in our hearts 
And really, that's what we're talking about here. And, that, uh, and how is a person a member of that? By being born from above, which includes the thought of, or not just the thought, the truth of faith by which we receive the grace of God. So who, who is in the kingdom of grace on this earth? All believers. All believers, believers. So this is, yeah, the, being a member of God's kingdom is, is a believer. Who is in God's kingdom in heaven? Everyone who's there, right? Everyone who's there. And so then also there, that's the third kingdom of God. Anybody know the terminology for that? We have his kingdom of power, his kingdom of grace, glory. his kingdom of glory in heaven. So, so anyway, so there we have, we have the, the kingdom of God. And it's good to, to note those different root places where God rules. And here, uh, cannot see the kingdom of God. We are talking about his gracious rule in our hearts on earth, being a member of of the church. So yeah, quite a bit of an extensive thought on uh, on verse three. And obviously Nicodemus didn't understand it. And we're gonna see that uh, you know, I'm not throwing things in out of place by that explanation because all of this adds in uh, in the follow up verses. Uh, any comments or, or questions or anything more on verse three? Yeah. Nicodemus was stuck there in verse four, right? I don't understand. Yeah, just he got stuck on just the physical, um, physical birth and and uh, thinking of uh, not, not God's rule in our hearts, but having to be a second birth into a into a new, different physical being. Okay. Yes, Sue, please. I, I find this translation um, easier to manage. Myself. Okay. I'm born, in, you know, of the spirit. Uh, or born from above is is less likely to confuse you on rebirth of body. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I like that. That really, it is the literal. And and, and are you you're born from above? You're comparing it with just the phrase "born again," right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that second birth. We can we know what it's talking about, but it, it does. It, it does open up possibility of other meanings. You know, I, I like the fact that it's not using the Greek word that means happening a second time or happening another time. It's it's a different location, a, a birth from above. Yeah, I, I would agree with you there. Anything else? Uh, Celia, let's see, would you take the next paragraph? Uh, a G, another amen, amen uh, saying by Jesus. So we're going to pay attention as you read uh, verses 5 through 8. Yeah, thank you. So here we have that that explanation to say, all right, this this is moving different from the physical, right? Different from God's kingdom of power, different from his rule in the entire universe. Um, unless someone is born of water and the spirit, uh, just grammatically, a lot, a lot of importance in the grammar here, because the Greek word ek is translated of or from. Okay, uh, um, and so, and actually, ek is better of uh, the, the and and then it goes with two nouns, water and spirit. Both go with that that uh, preposition of. So it's water birth and spirit birth, not not water not water or spirit. It's both, and that leads us to the concept here of baptism. Right, born of water and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit working through the Word, and, and that is that is a legitimate grammatical and and a hermeneutic that says yes, this is speaking Jesus speaking of of that sacrament of baptism. Yes, even before he institutes it at the end of of the of uh, the gospel. Uh, so, um, and that is the birth of the kingdom of God. All right. Um, yeah, they point to baptism, and and so 
now we don't have that uh have that uh, so, whoa okay what if a believer is never baptized right and, and I, my, my oftentimes I've, I've had that question come and say well really when a believer comes to faith and learns jesus commands he'll want to be baptized right now what if that desire is there but they there was something that prevented it from happening right uh, a believer dies but isn't baptized but that desire was there by faith or that knowledge had not grown grown yet that knowledge of baptism well if faith is there uh, they're in the kingdom of god but in general right if you believe you will want to be baptized it's really more the rejection of baptism that indicates the unbelief uh, if, if it would be a rejection, then the uh, lack of baptism, if that makes sense. So, yeah, uh, Celia, please. I think there's a malefactor in the class. He wasn't baptized as far as we know. Yeah, and Jesus, Jesus didn't take saliva and throw it at him or, or hey, drip some water over his head while I get to say, yeah. Uh, and, the, and the believers in the Old Testament were not baptized, right? Uh, they, they were, the males were circumcised, but, but the girls weren't left out of the kingdom of God, right? So yes, uh, we, we, do, we do see that as well. Um, so verse, verse five, uh, verse six, born of the flesh is flesh. And uh, that Greek word is sarx. Uh, we get our English word sarcophagus from it, right? The house for the flesh, <laughs> for the body. So it, it is, it is the, the body, the, the skin and bones, the, the flesh. And that sarx uh, is also then used oftentimes in scripture to, to show fallen humanity and their sinful nature. So when you have sarx as opposed to spirit, spirit is pneuma in Greek. Um, when you have uh, that juxtaposition of those two words, you'll have sinful nature, you'll have new man. And so the born of the fleshly part of human being is related to the suffering of the sinful human flesh, right? The human nature. Whatever is born of the spirit, the Holy Spirit doing the work, is spiritual. Um, so, I'm, so I'm using some adjectives in there to uh, to replace. But uh, yeah, literally, um, it, it is uh, just that. Having been born of the flesh is flesh. Having been born of the spirit is spirit. So in order to understand that concept, we add a few adjectives and recognize that that there is a word play when you say flesh is flesh, right? Spirit is spirit. And we recognize a connection of the uh, of, of that work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, questions or comments on that? I hope it wasn't uh, it was not uh, confusing there just with verse six. Okay. Um, yeah, human nature, my notes say human nature results from physical birth, the Holy Spirit, uh, gives spiritual life um all right so then verse seven don't be a surprised uh repeating that phrase born from above um and why shouldn't you be surprised it's hard to understand you're not going to wrap your mind around it uh you all understand wind right what can you tell me about the wind how fast it's blowing where it's coming from coming from the west or the east can't see it, can't see it. Can you tell me where the remnants of Hurricane Ian are going? Somewhere, north. Somewhere right? Not, not exactly, right? They're, where it goes, where it's going, you can't, you can tell some things about it, but uh, you're not gonna always be able to know everything about it. And the Spirit will reveal certain things about his work, working through the word, the wonderful blessings of being in the kingdom of God. That's the first thing that came to Carol's mind when she thought of the kingdom of God, those blessings. And yeah, definitely we can see those. We can know those about the work of the spirit, but we don't know all of uh, the details of it. Um, so that's really that, that thought in, in aid. It's an example of the limits of human understanding and definitely uh, limits of human control. Yeah. Well, so let's think of the power of the wind too kind of the power of the spirit yeah yeah we yeah definitely and and the um the 
uh, the word for spirit in Hebrew is actually the, the Hebrew word for wind. So, so there's, a, there's a relation there and context indicates, indicates that. And so, uh, and so like Ezekiel, his valley of dry, dry bones, <laughs> prophesied to the wind um, and wind come and prophesy to the spirit. You kind of, there's an interplay there of, of that, of how um, we, we, see the, we see another area where the wind and the spirit are, uh, are kind of used in a way that, that brings a picture that just says, okay, I don't fully understand this, but that's okay because it's God stuff and he'll reveal to me understanding according to his will. All right, uh, anything further there through, through verse eight? Well, of course, uh, Nicodemus doesn't understand. He has to make that abundantly clear. So he has another question. Um, Dave, could you read verses nine through 13? How can these things be, asked Nicodemus? You are the teacher of Israel, Jesus answered, and you do not know these things. Amen, amen, I tell you, we speak what we know and we testify about what we have seen, but you people do not accept our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man, who is in heaven. Okay, so Jesus is going to take the opportunity. Nicodemus, he doesn't understand, but uh, what, what a neat question of, of faith. Maybe even weak faith that knows Jesus is a, is a teacher or is from God, but I don't understand. So tell me more, right? And what, what, a neat, what a neat thing for a pastor to hear that or, or a teacher. Uh, a school teacher, right? I, I don't understand, but tell me more. So, all right, you ask, right? Let, let me give you some more information uh, for a mom or a dad, for the, the child to say, I don't understand God. I don't understand something God does. Oh, maybe it's a hard question they're asking, but let me help. Let me, let me explain. Let me, uh, we, Jesus could give the answer as the word. But when we hear that question, how can this be? Tell me more. We go to his word, right? To, to his Bible. All right. And uh, you're a teacher of Israel. See, does that sound a little negative towards Nicodemus? You're a teacher and you don't know these things? Well, you're not in your heads. Why do you think Jesus is, is uh, sounding a little negative there? You don't know this? Why don't you know this? Now, pick, go ahead. Yeah, Carol, please. I think it's because the Pharisees were known for, for all their getting to the nitty gritty of scripture. So they would memorize the whole Torah. So if he had memorized all of these things as part of his study, how come he didn't get it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, he saw would have had an intimate knowledge of the word of scripture uh, of the of the Old Testament, Moses and the prophets, all all of that, and yet he he didn't know these things. Jesus is saying, well, you really should know this from studying scripture. How, you, these things should be there. Um, teacher of Israel, what's his position? It's important, and and actually the teacher. Um, we don't know the details of the, all of the ranking of the different positions on the council or teaching, but, but I, I think that the, that definite article, uh, which is there in the Greek as well, um, is, is indicating uh, that, that other people recognized him as the teacher, you know, one important teacher, maybe a, in a group of teachers, but but uh, but really, the article points out the the one the, you know he's recognized by his colleagues, uh, maybe a, a lead teacher in a certain area, um, and you don't know. And and yes, uh, it, it's always good for me to be reminded to go to like a seminary symposium or a pastor's study and be reminded how little I know. I come back and I say, oh, yeah, I should probably do some more study here, right? If, if, I, if I'm amongst people who see me as the expert who knows everything, pastor has the answer to all the questions, 
I can get pretty full of myself. It happens to me too. Um, so to be to be reminded to to put myself in Nicodemus' shoes and to say, oh yeah, I don't know these things. That Jesus explained them to me. It, it's it's good to hear. Um, so it, it, when we don't know everything, we we want Jesus to tell us that, right? And so while there might be a little bit of a negative slant. Um, that it, it's just recognizing again that the human limitations that we all do have to uh, recognize. Um, interesting in verse 11, we have the, the amen, amen again, right? Um, and Jesus says, we, we speak what we know. And you take that, uh, we, uh, we testify about what we have seen, but you people do not accept our testimony. It wasn't until I was preparing for today that I caught that First person plural we. Take a moment and think, what does first person plural we, who, who's all included when Jesus is we? Earlier he said, I tell you. And even just with amen, amen, I tell you, but we, who's the we? It's all the Old Testament prophecies and uh, what the New Testament was also saying. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I, I included that thought in my notes of that. Uh, we, um, he's going, he's putting himself on par with the Old Testament prophets, and then also the New Testament church that, that will be formed. We, we, we all of us speak uh, of these things, and, um, and he, he's, he is really, he's not just saying, my disciples and I, as I share the message with you today, He's going all the way back to Moses and the prophets. We are speaking of these things we, we know. Um, so this is kind of getting again, but, but you, you you're, uh, you're not accepting. You, you, you know, you can memorize the, the Old Testament scriptures, Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, but, uh, but you're not accepting it. <laughs> you're, 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 you're not recognizing the, the need for the Messiah, your inability to keep the law. Dave, I kept talking after you raised your hand. The Old Testament prophets only spoke what God told them to speak. Yes. And uh, so that the uh, teachers of the law at, during Jesus' time, such as Nicodemus and others, were back there. That was really God speaking through the Old Testament uh, prophets. Yeah. And uh, they really should have paid more attention to what they were saying. Yeah, and not adding their own traditions to it uh, and, and elevating that. Uh, Celia, comment? The people's Bible says, even to God the Father, when he says we testify, it's talking about God the Father, also to the disciples okay. and the prophets and all that. Yeah, and, and yeah, there's a relation there. So, yeah, we don't, that's that, that, uh, uh, it, how it is this we also inclusive of God the Father, and that doesn't contradict the thought of the prophets, because what, what, did, who, what did words did the prophets say? What the triune God gave them to say, of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, so, yeah, got that message, basically, yeah, we know this because God's showed it to us, and, and you're not listening. Um, right, and so, verse 12, if Nicodemus didn't grasp these things about how God works on earth, how God's kingdom grows in the human heart through faith, not by works, not by earning it, not by obeying the commandments. Nicodemus, if you're not grasping how God's working on earth, you're going to understand where the wind blows. You're going to understand the power that's behind the kingdom of God in human hearts. Um, no, don't ask me to explain uh, level five algebra when I'm when you're having trouble with level one. Is there level five algebra? I don't know. <laughs> don't, don't, don't look for trigonometry before you understand algebra one and, and in, in, pretty much it would be a comparison as well. If you're not understanding how God's working on earth, you're not going to understand the power behind the scenes. And, and even if you do understand that know and that faith, uh, there's a limit to our understanding of that power. Uh, comments or questions through that, uh, through verse 12? Yeah, um, verse 13, uh, Sue, please, before I move on to verse 13, key verse. I was thinking the, the Jewish leaders were taking things maybe too literally and not going, like, 
and deferring their understanding, and sometimes that happens to us as well. That we um, we say the words, but we don't dig down enough to learn a little bit more or to um, understand in a, another context. Yes, um, it, it it goes back to the sinful flesh's nature includes the opinion of the law. Latin is the opinio legis. What's the opinion of the law? I can do it, right? And so that opinion of the law, I can get to heaven by myself. And whenever human beings, Pharisees are an example of it, we are always in danger of it as long as this flesh, <laughs> this sinful nature is part of us. We are always in danger of going back to giving ourselves some credit or looking at something we do to get to God. So, um, yeah, so this is definitely a warning call to us. Um, your, your sinful mind with the opinion legacy is never going to completely understand that kingdom of grace, which is not according to the law. It's according to the gospel. Yes, definitely a good, good word of warning for us. Um, Anything else through verse 12? Uh, yes. Carol, uh, just building on what Sue said, um, it reminds me of some other uh, um, conversations that Jesus had with other Pharisees who had closed their minds. Nicodemus at least is trying to understand and so how patient Jesus is with him to take him where he needs to go. Yes, very, very good comment that right we do have we do have a, a willing learner here and and we take that that is why I kind of had that question earlier right it sounds pretty negative you don't know these things and um, and, and yet that negative is really setting the tone for a, a, a willing learner growing and that then that definitely marks Nicodemus. Uh, as distinct, uh, different from most of the majority of the of the Sanhedrin of the ruling council. Uh, yeah, good point. All right, key verse in verse twelve, right? And let me just do a, a literal translation of the Greek. I won't bore you with the Greek, but uh, um, very uh, it's just going to be literally word for word. And no person has gone up into the heaven uh, except the one from the heaven who has come down, the one has having come down, the son of man. Okay, so uh, when you take a literal word for word Greek, it's a little stilted, not the way we speak, but a good translation here. Uh, basically the, the no one, yeah, why, you don't understand because you haven't gone up to heaven. You haven't seen the workings uh, of these heavenly things. You're not gonna understand the power, but there's one who has. Right, the one who came down. So the one who's been up there and knows the working of God, God the Father and, and the Holy Spirit is the Son who came down and the Son of Man who is in heaven. And I should have, this strikes me as I believe the first occurrence of the phrase Son of Man in the Gospel of John. I may be wrong, but... Um, Um, glancing very quickly through the first through chapters, but um, different terms. Oh, yeah, he is the only son from the Father, uh, so we have that uh, that Son of God. But I believe that the Son of Man termina. Oh, no, nope, I'm wrong. End of end of. Uh, it comes back to uh, Jesus calling the disciples. His conversation with uh, Nathaniel. Right, you'll see him ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Uh, but yeah, so it is not the first time it, it was used, but it, it's repeating that messianic phrase. And uh, it, it's that circular concept of coming back to a, a truth over and over again. Who is Jesus? Well, uh, this is the Son of Man. And more about the Son of Man? Well, when he talked to Nathaniel, what did we learn about the Son of Man? That's the angels, uh, the stairway, the, the stairs, uh, the, the ladder to heaven. He's the, he's the mediator between human beings and God. And um, here we have uh, a, a, another truth added to that or another portion of that truth as the mediator, uh, the, the, 
the stairway, the connection to God, we have the truth that he is in heaven, right? And he has that knowledge of the workings of heaven as well. So uh, he is the one who can reveal those important truths to us. Uh, comments, questions further on verse 13. So uh, I'm just going to read another thing from, uh, uh, from a quote from Luther. Uh, Jesus calls himself the son of man who has his existence both on earth and in heaven simultaneously. Uh, not, not me, I can't do that, right? <laughs> Nobody can, but, the, but the, the very true God. All right, uh, let's move ahead to verse, verse 14. And I might not make it as far as I expected to today. Carol, could you just take verse 14, please? <clears throat> and 14 and 15. Okay. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness. Uh, uh, that might be me that lost the volume somehow. Can you hear me now? You should be able to hear me. You're probably speaking, but I'm not hearing you. So I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, sorry about that. Technical difficulties. Uh, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up said, everyone who believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Um, yeah, we, that's a reference to Numbers 21.9. Uh, remember when the, the Israelites in the desert complained, 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 one of the many times they did, the, that stiff-necked people, and God sent the poisonous serpents or the fiery serpents, uh, 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 that fiery is the way I picture it, but then I always think of that burning, but uh, uh, really the poisonous is, is the concept there. And, and so many people died, but what was the rescue? Then they cried out to Moses, God said, lift up that snake, um, make a bronze snake and anybody who looks at it will live. And so I can picture even someone with a weak faith looking at that uh, and, and God saying, no, you, you will live as well. And, and so, uh, that Jesus is making comparison, that, that rescue from the death of the, by poisonous venom of the snakes for the Israelites was a picture of looking at the Son of Man who was lifted up on the cross in payment for our sins. So we believe in him, who everyone who believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Uh, starting with verse 15, that everyone uh, believing and life, those three three words uh, come come back repeatedly through that. Um, comments or, or questions? Okay, so let's go ahead and we're gonna together read verse 16. Uh, this translation may be a little different than we are used to, but let's give it a shot all together reading just verse 16. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So I would just, just start to open that up and probably won't get beyond this, this verse today, but um, we, we have God the Father uh, and his love is that motivation, uh, that uh, love from the Father. Uh, it's, it's a giving love, it's an independent love. That is the Greek word uh, agape. Uh, and that he, he loved the world so much. And uh, what did he give? His uh, one and only son, the only begotten, his only son. Uh, um, and by being uh, the only one who was born of the father from eternity, right? But then also born of God through the birth and of the, through the Holy Spirit. And the purpose is just stating again what was said in verse 15. Everyone who believes, and here, not, not everyone, verse 16, but whoever, right? Just that, that open-ended, uh, believing, that, that faith, that trust, that, that reliance, um, and not the perishing, not dying, not, not being separated from God eternity, eternally, but the opposite, living, living forever. Uh, comments or questions on that as we kind of wrap it up and leave you hanging on this uh, 
gospel rich verse until we get back next week. Uh, Sue, please. Um, I may be missed this all along, but when you just said Jesus was born of God begotten, and then he was born of the spirit when he was born physically through Mary. Um, it, it just It's interesting to think of Jesus born of the spirit like we need to be born of the spirit. Am I a um, yeah, probably, do, probably don't need to uh, bring that. Um, so conceived by the power. Of the, so I'm going to the words of the, the Apostles Creed, the Nicene Creed, right? Um, eternally begotten of the father begotten of the father that that god was his father from eternity in in existence and then when he was born of the virgin mary he was conceived by the holy spirit the, the holy spirit's working um so that that is so unique and so much only begotten so, so different from ours that i'd rather stay away from that comparison although it, yeah, we are children of God too. We are sons of God through faith. But the only way that we are born of the Spirit, the only way that we are sons of God is by the virtue of what he accomplished as being the only begotten son of God, the, 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 uh, the one born of the Spirit. So I don't know if that answers you, but okay. All right. Well, uh, why don't we wrap things up then, and we'll we'll take verse sixteen again next uh, next week to to get us moving further. But we'll close with a blessing: the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit uh, be with us all. Amen. Thank you, and uh, sorry for uh, the technical difficulties. We will see you next week.